alopecia may okay today's talk is on alopecia made simple i uh like most of you during my training alopecia was this incredibly complicated confusing uh area of dermatopathology and over the years, I, I've kind of learned that it's actually much simpler than we make it out to be. And so hopefully after this talk, you'll find it uh, simpler as well. So the purpose, of, everybody's seeing the full screen, right? Yep, we see it. Good. All right. Okay. So it's, what, not this, it's not in part. It's not in present like the, all right, so like in the PowerPoint view. Okay, so we're sharing the wrong screen. All right, let's just. Go to the zoo. All right. Oh, it says your screen sharing. Oh, right, I'm yeah, sharing the wrong screen. Yeah. All right, let's and then share. you want to go to the PowerPoint, this one, and press share. We got there the we full go. screen now? No, we don't. Yeah, we do. Okay, yeah, do. good. All right. So the purpose of this lecture is not to discuss the etiology of all kinds of alopecia. Okay. Uh, and when you probably already know much more about the medical aspects of alopecia than I ever will. But what I'm trying to teach you today is a simple way of approaching alopecia that's going to help you diagnose essentially 99.9% .9 of all the alopecias that you're going to encounter and essentially give you a way of treating 100% of the alopecias which you encounter. So let's talk about uh, normal hair and normal scalp. So in a normal four millimeter punch biopsy, we're going to see four to six hairs in cross section. And just to go over some of the basics here, uh, the epidermis and the dermis, the hairs, the hair follicles or the papillae, normally these are down in the uh, subcutis. And here's an erector pili muscle. Uh, there might be one miniaturized hair here. In, in general, when we look at a, a hair biopsy, it's going to be a, a hundred percent antigen hairs and a cross section. And about one out of twenty biopsies, you might find a catagen or telogen hair. Uh, so that's really what the normal is. <clears throat> So depending on who you read, 85 to 95% of hairs are antigen. So uh, if only 5% of hairs are not antigen, then in a normal, if you have six hairs on the biopsy, you would have to do around you know, 18 or 20 biopsies to find just one telogen or catagen hair. Uh, and we said normal bulbs extend to the subcutis uh, in a vertical section. Uh, in horizontal sections, uh, and this is from a study, there have been other studies about these, but they're all more or less the same. So in a cross section, we see somewhere between 16 and 20 follicles in a horizontal section. Uh, they're mostly terminal follicles. So 15 out of the 16 are going to be terminal follicles, uh, mostly antigen and a rare catagen or telogen follicle. On average, one, uh, so not very many. And here is a close-up of one of our follicles. We have the hair, so-called Adamson's fringe. We have the inner root sheath, the outer root sheath, this perifollicular sheath, which is important uh, in uh, some kinds of alopecia because it tends to be thickened and Catagen hairs, and we have the follicular papilla. And in this normal antigen hair, 
we have a nice kind of ball and claw uh, configuration of the hair follicle. And that's how we know it's an antigen hair. In the normal hair cycle, we have our antigen hair. Uh, as we said, 85 to 95% of the hairs are an antigen. Uh, then during the normal cycle, a small percentage of hairs will start to uh, go into the catagen phase, which is a regressive phase. Uh, the catagen phase is important because uh, first of all, we rarely see it on biopsies, uh, and it shows that the hairs are starting to regress. Uh, in the catagen phase, we start to lose the ball and claw, and we also get a very thickened basement membrane around the hair. In the telogen phase, which is kind of the inactive phase of the follicle, uh, we lose the ball and claw, and we have sort of like what I like to call, I don't know if you can see me, but two fists opposing each other. So the, the, uh, the, there's no actual, uh, the uh, papilla is not engulfed uh, by the follicle. And then in a miniaturized hair, the hair itself is the size of a telogen hair, but it actually still has the ball and claw. So we know that it's an antigen hair, but this hair no longer has its hair bulb down in the subcutis. It's a very diminished in size hair. In transverse sections, pretty much, uh, if you can turn everything 90 degrees, uh, this is kind of what you see. We don't really do transverse sections at Mount Sinai, but uh, other people do, and I understand that you're tested on it, so I'll go over as best I can. Uh, so this is our uh, when we have a regressing hair, we yeah, have yeah. fibrous. Can you see it? Sorry, question. This is the fibrous area beneath the catagen hair, this area down here. Uh, we have a, a telogen uh, papilla, and then we have regular terminal antigen hair. There's no hair in this one. Uh, this is a catagen hair with a thickened uh, basement membrane around it. Uh, and uh, this is a terminal uh, telogen hair uh, that is uh, somewhat diminished in size. All right, so why do we get alopecia? It's, it's pretty simple. So we either have destruction of the follicles or absence of the follicles. And these are things that we've termed scarring alopecias, which we'll get into. Or we have an abnormality of the phase of the follicle. So there's too many regressing hairs or too many catagen hairs. Uh, we can also have an abnormality of the size of the follicle. So hairs that would normally be terminal in things like androgenetic alopecia become miniaturized or, or vellus type follicles. Uh, also, we can get alopecia from an abnormality of the hair shaft. And we're not going to talk about that today. But, you know, things that cause congenital abnormalities of the hair shaft, trauma to the hair, infection, uh, can cause clinical alopecia. But they don't necessarily cause abnormalities that we can see histopathologically. All right, so this is the crux of the talk. It's pretty simple. Uh, what three things do we look for in alopecia? The first thing we look at is the number of hairs. Uh, like I said, cross-section, 16 to 20 hairs, uh, longitudinal sections, Four, and we're talking about a four millimeter punch, four to six hairs. So it's pretty easy. You just count. They're either normal or they're decreased. And especially when you're doing vertical sections, we get multiple levels and make sure in, in any individual section, you may have a decrease or increased number of hairs. But if we section through the whole thing, we, we get the gist of how many hairs there are in the biopsy. 
The second thing we look for is the size of the hairs. Are the hairs all terminal hairs? Are they all going into the subcutis or are they small? Are the, we starting to see the papillae in the dermis? As soon as you start seeing a significant number of papillae in the dermis, there's something abnormal going on with the size and or phase of the hair. And then if we do decide that there's a normal number of hairs, but they're decreased in size, what's causing that? Is it a, an abnormal phase? Are these telogen hairs? Are they catagen hairs? Or are they miniaturized hair? And then the third thing we look at is inflammation. Is there inflammation present or not? And if there is, where is that inflammation? Is it a, we'll go on. So the first thing that we look at is the number of hairs. And it's either going to be normal or decreased. We really don't get biopsies for increased numbers of hairs. Uh, if the hairs are decreased in number, we call that a scarring alopecia. Now, this is something that's been that's confusing because there isn't necessarily an actual scar. And we talked about four to six. So here's a normal scalp biopsy, lots of hairs, all going, essentially all, we can't even see the papillae. And this is pretty normal. Uh, we can't even see the papillae because they're so deep in the subcutis. And then here's a scarring alopecia. There's no hairs at all. There's a bunch of erector pili muscles here, but no hairs. So the term scarring alopecia has been confusing medical students, residents, and clinicians since, and the earliest reference I could find to cicatricial alopecia was 1849. I suspect it's probably older than that, but at least since then, it's confusing because especially pathology residents, uh, when they hear the term scarring alopecia, they expect to see a scar and there isn't necessarily a scar. I found this article from the Buffalo Medical Journal from 1849 talking about cicatricial alopecia. So cicatricial alopecia is a type of alopecia that causes permanent hair loss due to inflammation that destroys hair follicles. It doesn't actually say anything about an actual cicatrix or scar. So if we look at a case of, of scarring alopecia, there's just a decreased number of hairs. There's no scar. Some kinds of scarring alopecia have scars, but mo most of the things that we think of as scarring alopecia don't. So, uh, Lots of pilosebaceous units, not necessarily a scar. So first misconception, no scar and scarring alopecia. The second thing we look at is the size of the hairs. The size of the hairs is either going to be normal or it's going to be decreased. And as we said, if they're decreased, are they miniaturized antigen hairs or are they out of phase antigen or telogen hairs? Now, so if we go back to that study about uh, normal scalp and transverse sections, we expect to see about 90% of the hairs being terminal antigen follicles and a very small percent being catagen and a slightly larger percent, 6% maybe being terminal uh, telogen follicles. So in a, a regular cross section of his of you know 16 to 20 hairs, maybe one telogen hair would be normal. So when we're talking about things that are out of phase, we're generally talking about an increase in telogen or catagen follicles. So here's our normal scalp, and here's an example of a non-scarring alopecia. The hairs are all miniaturized. Uh, but there's a normal number. If we start counting one, two, three, four, five hairs, it's certainly a normal hair density. The hairs are just way too small. The third thing we look for is inflammation. 
Is it present or absent? If it's present, where is the inflammation? So there are certain patterns that we look for. Alopecia areata tends to be peribulbar. Lichen planopilaris tends to be at the level of the isthmus. If the inflammation is in the follicle, then we're thinking about a folliculitis. Uh, if it's at the dermal epidermal junction or perivascular, then we tend to think about lupus erythematosus. There's really not that many choices. So here's a case. We all see lots of inflammation at the level of the isthmus. Here's a, another case where we see inflammation at the uh, at, around the hair bulb. And another case where there's inflammation all along the follicle. And here's a case where we have inflammation not only along the follicle, but perivascular inflammation and interface dermatitis. So we look for the pattern of inflammation in inflammatory alopecia. Uh, like many things in life, our choices in alopecia are limited. There's really only four classifications of alopecia. It's either scarring and inflammatory, scarring, non-inflammatory, non-scarring, inflammatory, and non-scarring, non-inflammatory. So there's really only four choices uh, with, with some overlap. <clears throat> so, uh, and I kind of got this concept from Bonnie Lee's lecture, which is a great lecture on alopecia. It's on YouTube if you have a chance to look at it. But she made the first distinction, which I think is that I've heard people talk about, about scarring alopecia with or without an actual scar. And it's important because most of the things that we talk about with scarring alopecia or permanent alopecia are things like lichen planopilaris, frontal fibrosing, central centrifugal alopecia, or lupus alopecia, where there's destruction of pilosebaceous units uh, without an actual scar. And then there are alopecias that actually do cause very significant scars. The chronic deep folliculitides like acne keloidalis, dissecting cellulitis, acne keloidalis, things like that, and even tinea can cause uh, rupture of follicles and destruction of follicles with an actual scar. Uh, so here's an example of an inflammatory scarring alopecia. We see lots of inflammation along the follicle and only one follicle in this punch biopsy. So uh, it's follicles are decreased. Uh, this is kind of exceptional because usually in lichen planopilaris, the, uh, uh, you know, you don't have one preservation for just one follicle. They're either all destroyed or, or mostly destroyed. Maybe if you biopsy the advancing edge, you get something like this. And I'm just going to give a caveat to this lecture since I started putting it together uh, on Monday. Uh, the internet is rife with misinformation and really not great examples of some of these alopecias, including app presenters. So hopefully, if I ever give this again, I will add some more, uh, what I consider to be classic examples of different alopecias. Uh, so here's another cross-section of lichen planopilaris. What do we see? Well, we see a decreased number of follicles and we can see that this cross section is at the level of the isthmus because there are sebaceous glands here. And what we see is inflammation and loss of follicles and there's inflammation at this level of the isthmus. Here's another case of inflammatory scarring alopecia of lupus. Uh, in lupus, uh, we have loss of pilosebaceous units. Uh, in this case, we don't have an interface dermatitis, but we do have some perivascular inflammation, and we have epidermal atrophy and follicular plugging. Uh, generally pretty easy to distinguish lupus from lichen planopilaris because lupus involves more than just the follicle. It usually involves the epidermis, 
Uh, there's usually some dispigmentation uh, and it's also perivascular. Uh, I'm putting in chronic deep folliculitis and I generally lump these things together. So things like acne keloidalis, uh, folliculitis decalvans and dissecting cellulitis, they all look pretty similar under the microscope and they basically have the same etiology. So what we have is actual inflammatory destruction of the follicles, it's often suppurative, with an actual scar uh, and an inflammatory. So here's the scar, high power, and often an inflammatory infiltrate that contains numerous plasma cells. So uh, I know when we see plasma cells, we often think of syphilis, but frankly, the you probably see the most plasma cells that you're ever going to see in a uh, one of these chronic, you know, uh, deep folliculitides, uh, also things of the follic so-called follicular occlusion triad, like uh, 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 Anyhow, you know what I'm, I'm talking about, uh, hydradenitis supertiva and things like that. All right. Uh, next category, inflammatory non-scarring alopecia. So this is our common inflammatory alopecias. These are uh, usually reversible. Uh, and the most common one is alopecia areata, which we see peribulbar inflammation. Uh, it's interesting that uh, there's not as much written about syphilitic alopecia as, as you would think, since it's such an old disease. Uh, and so I, my own experience with it is, is probably two or three cases over 40 years. Uh, and my cases have been uh, not looked particularly like uh, alopecia areata, but some people, a lot of people feel it does look, it can be a mimic of alopecia areata. Other people say that it can have an interface dermatitis and plasma cells like regular syphilis. Uh, the one thing that it has dramatically changed, and I had this case with Dr. Rudikoff at Bronx Lebanon, if you stain these for spirochetes, they're absolutely loaded with spirochetes. Uh, Follicular mucinosis or alopecia mucinosa has perifollicular inflammation with mucin in the follicle. Uh, there may also be changes of mycosis fungoides since it's often associated with MF or uh, can be associated with a bite or drug eruption. And then folliculitis can be either scarring or non-scarring and we look for neutrophils in the follicle. One thing to remember is that early scarring alopecia, like if you get the edge of LPP, we may not actually see loss of pilosebaceous units then, because if it's early, the, the normal follicles are being attacked, but they haven't been destroyed yet. Uh, this is actually when we want a biopsy, because theoretically we can treat it and, and prevent, kind of prevent it from progressing. Uh, so this is our classic uh, lesion of alopecia areata. We have plenty of hairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hairs. Uh, and all the, the hairs are starting to, all the hairs are in the same, what, we, what Bernie Eckerman used to say, the same stage of devolution. They're all kind of regressing at the same rate. And this is sort of the thing that we see clinically in alopecia areata, that, that you don't lose like one hair at a time. Usually the whole spot goes bald more or less at the same time. And the histologic correlate of this is all the hairs entering the catagen or telogen phase more or less at the same time. And in this particular case, there's a little bit of inflammation around the hair bulbs, but not overly abundant. Uh, one of the things to look for in alopecia areata is these thickened 
basement membranes of the catagen hairs, and of course the uh, inflammatory cells around the dermal papillae. Here's just a case I, I showed it earlier, but uh, like in Planal pilaris, when it's early, we just have perifollicular inflammation at the level of the isthmus and kind of destruction of the uh, sebaceous glands, but we still have one, two, three, four, maybe five follicles in this biopsy. So they're, they're on their way to being destroyed, but they haven't been completely destroyed yet. And so this can be confusing. And then here's a case of follicular mucinosis. Uh, this is something that uh, it's perifollicular inflammation, but in what we see at low power is something that kind of looks like spongiosis in the hair follicles. And at high power, it still looks like spongiosis in the hair follicle. But if we get a colloidal iron stain, we can see that it's actually mucin. Uh, and therefore we call it uh, alopecia mucinosis, or it's really a reaction pattern under the microscope. We call it follicular mucinosis. And then I usually ask if the patient has a history or other, other stigmata of mycosis fungoides in this patient, since uh, I would say more than half the cases we see are associated with that. Okay. We have non-inflammatory, non-scarring alopecia. So when we're seeing something with no inflammation and no scars, uh, we think about telogen effluvium, uh, trichotillomania, uh, traction alopecia. We may see different hair phases, pigment casts and distorted hairs, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Androgenetic alopecia, where we just see miniaturized hairs, but preservation of the sebaceous glands. Alopecia areata, sort of in the later stages, it's no longer really that inflammatory. Uh, and we just see miniaturized telogen hairs. Uh, and congenital triangular alopecia, which is pretty rare, I've only seen one case. Uh, all you just see is vellus hairs. So in telogen effluvium, so the only the the main uh, advantage that people put towards doing the transverse sections is to count the uh, telogen hairs and catogen hair ratio, and in telogen effluvium it's less than fifty percent, and in alopecia areata it's greater than fifty percent. This is something you probably need to know for your board. I think as a practical matter, it's it's not really that important. First of all, everybody has seen a case of telogen effluvium or probably had it. And when a patient with telogen effluvium walks into your office, they you don't know why they're in their, your office. If they're walking in with lichen planopilaris or androgenetic alopecia, you have a pretty good idea why they're there. But when you look at the patient, they usually don't have very uh, obvious hair loss. And that's because even if you double or triple the number of hairs that you're losing, which is a lot, and you would see that on your hair brush, uh, it, you know, if you triple it from, you know, 6% to 18%, then you're really not going to have a very significant difference in the biopsy, and especially in a horizontal biopsy. You're not, I mean, a vertical biopsy, you may or may not even find a telogen hair, even if, you know, because if 18% of the hairs, you're lucky to get one telogen hair on a vertical section. So the horizontal sections, maybe you can pick up two or three hairs. Usually it's not going to be very significantly increased. And frankly, we almost never get biopsies of telogen effluvium anyway. So I would regard telogen effluvium as usually looking like normal hair or in a cross section, maybe very slightly increased numbers of telogen hairs. Like here, I mean, I can only make out maybe one or maybe a second telogen hair. I don't know. Pretty, pretty normal looking. Okay. Uh, so traction alopecia is, is another kind of alopecia that is said to be non-scarring. 
we've all seen cases of traction alopecia that actually are scarring uh, because if you pull out the hair long enough and often enough, eventually it doesn't grow back. Uh, so what we see is no significant inflammation. In this case, we see a normal number of hairs, uh, one, two, three, four, and maybe a fifth one. And then the things that we look for in traction alopecia are these pigment casts and these distorted hairs. And this is just something you want to burn into your uh, eyes because this is the kind of thing you, you get shown a picture of and you see the pigment cast and distorted hair and it's uh, uh, traction alopecia or trichotillomania. Uh, I don't think they're really very distinguishable, but, but some people emphasize more of the corkscrew hairs in... Uh, in trichotillomania. Here's a horizontal section also showing the pigment cast and the distorted hair. So these are things you want to kind of uh, have a mental image of because it's the sort of thing you get tested on. Uh, so androgenetic alopecia, uh, I my wife makes fun of me because I have a bunch of these old baggy looking shorts. This is uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the uh, head of the Labor Party in England. Uh, I see he he has adopted my style. And I think of androgenetic alopecia as you get shorter as you get aged, but the shorts stay the same size. Uh, in androgenetic alopecia, we've got the sebaceous glands are all the same size, but the hairs are too small. So these are the shorts and these are the old men. Uh, and it also tends to occur in old men, but also anybody can get it. But anyhow, so what we see is, I wouldn't call it sebaceous hyperplasia, but it looks like sebaceous hyperplasia because the sebaceous glands are all of a sudden are kind of awfully large for the uh, uh, size of the follicle. And no significant inflammation. If we count the follicles, there's a normal number of follicles. And if we look here, we can see there's still a ball and claw. So we know that these are antigen follicles are not uh, telogen or otherwise. Uh, here's a case of alopecia areata where we don't see any inflammation, but we do see a number of catagen hairs. And sometimes we get biopsies like this where we, we see the regressing hair, but we don't see the inflammation, but it doesn't mean that it's not alopecia areata. And here's a cross section of alopecia areata in the late stage. There's really not very much inflammation, but they're all telogen hairs. Actually, you could argue, as I have argued often, that uh, if alopecia areata goes on too long, it becomes scarring, but uh, that's a debate for another time. And then our last categorization is scarring non-inflammatory alopecia. So uh, first of all, this is something that we see in the end stage of, of lots of alopecias. Uh, end stage lichen planopilaris or pseudopalad almost looks like normal skin. And I would say that a lot of times, like if people who have been sitting at our microscope uh, when we get a biopsy of end-stage LPP, uh, don't know that it's a scalp biopsy. It just looks like normal skin. And if you don't pick up on the erector pili muscles, uh, it, it looks pretty normal. Chronic traction alopecia, eventually everything, uh, it, the hair stops growing back. And you may get little fibrous tracts in, in chronic traction that's purported to be a way of diagnosing it. Uh, I think late stage scarring, uh, non scarring alopecias like traction and al alopecia areata do lead to scarring at the end. So I, I'm often asked, like, how do we tell? late stage lupus from end stage lichen planopilaris since they're both scarring alopecias. Well, 
as I said earlier, lichen planus pilaris only affects the follicle. So when we have end stage LPP, uh, it looks normal afterwards. There's no interface dermatitis. There's no dispigmentation. Lupus has all the stigmata of lupus that you also see clinically. Like even after the patient loses all their hair in an area of discoid lupus, they often have atrophy, hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, and you can see the follicular plugs. So those things kind of remain even after the hair has already been destroyed. And then uh, aplasia cutis, uh, it's a, a, kind of a rare thing, but we do see it sometimes. And in this case, we see no appendages and no erector pili muscles, at no dermal appendages of any kind. So it looks a little bit different. So let's look at some of these. So this is a late stage of uh, so-called pseudopallad. Uh, for some reason, nobody photographs these on the internet, so this is the best I could do. Uh, but we have preservation of the erector pili muscles and no hairs left. Otherwise, looks pretty normal. Here's aplasia cutis. And in aplasia cutis, we can see in this little area there's nothing. It just looks like a scar. Uh, and there's no structures of any kind. And often, like, you might actually just call this a scar if you didn't have a history of the, this was a spot of congenital hair loss. Uh, I'm giving a lecture. Uh, all right, so that's it. Simple, right? And only 40 minutes. We learned everything about alopecia. So uh, I'm just going to run through some important images that you might see that you're going to be tested on. Uh, this is uh, the perifollicular fibrosis that we sometimes see in lichen plano pilaris. Uh, so sometimes we see fibrosis next to the uh, isthmic portion of the follicle without very much inflammation. Here's another example of that. Inflammation plus fibrosis. This is a cross section where we see three catagen hairs. So when you see that, and here's a fibrous tract, so think alopecia areata. When you see alopecia mixed with an interface dermatitis, and here we see some vacuolar change and lots of melanophages in the dermis, think discoid lupus. When you see the distorted hairs and the pigment cast, think traction alopecia. And when we see our perifollicular uh, infiltrate of lymphocytes, and actually here's an eosinophil, uh, we think the swarm of bees and think alopecia areata. And that's it. So anybody have any questions? Anybody still awake? Dr. Nee, thank you so much for giving this presentation. Uh, I do have one question uh, regarding sure. um, scalp biopsies. Yes. So oftentimes we're told um, basically if it's a scarring alopecia, then we'll want to do a punch. If it's a non-scarring alopecia, then we'll want to do a shave or, you know, based off of what it is that the type of alopecia we're thinking, we'll um, choose between either one of those two things. But we're not really ever really told about like the location of which that we should be doing these biopsies. So like an example of which would be like, um, if say for instance, we had a patient that had like LPP or FFA that's been going on for some time, you know, I presume that we would necessarily not want to biopsy right at the frontal portion of where we thought the scalp, the original like hairline was and biopsy more uh like closer to an area of like active inflammation that's going on. And I just didn't know if you had any like um, 
uh, additional advice in regard to that. Okay, I do. The, the first additional advice is never, ever do a shape biopsy for alopecia. Why? I don't know who would advise you of that, but that is not good advice. Okay, as you could see from many of our slides, and I, if I can stop the screen share and see you face to face, uh, I will. Uh, okay, it, it, that that's just not good advice. Always do a punch biopsy. We saw many cases of non-scarring alopecias that you only could make the diet, like you're never going to see the swarm of bees if you did a shave biopsy. That's just crazy talk. You know, yeah, you could do a shave biopsy maybe for androgenetic alopecia if that's what you thought it was. But I would say in general, if you're going to biopsy alopecia, don't do a shave biopsy. That's the first thing. The second thing, I think, and it's an interesting question because when I was a fellow and for it really up until now, I was always taught to biopsy the advancing edge of alopecia. Uh, and uh, I still think that's the best advice, especially if you have an area of active hair loss. I do think that when you get end-stage alopecia, especially if you think it's chronic alopecia areata or something, you may end up, if you biopsy the the alopecia area, you may end up with uh, a normal, it looks like normal skin with no hairs. And we won't know whether it's, you know, LPP or alopecia areata. So I always think that's better. But I do think we're, you know, like I said, if it's a scar, the scar looks different in lupus than it does in LPP. Uh, I mean, by scar, I mean an area of active hair, uh, no hairs not an actual scar. So if it's a bald spot, biopsy, biopsy the center of the bald spot, probably going to give you some useful information. The edge of the bald spot or an area of active hair loss gives you the most inflammation. Does that answer your question? And somebody has texted about the biopsy size. I would say absolute minimum four millimeters. The more important thing is and I see this a lot, uh, is to get the biopsy down to the subcutis, which is not always so easy on the scalp and may require a slightly larger biopsy depending on the patient. A lot of people have very angled looking hair, so the punch doesn't always get, you know, follow the angle that the hair is growing out of the scalp. Uh, but I do see a lot of punch biopsies that don't get subcutis, so we don't have the hair bulbs to look at. Uh, so I think that's important because uh, the most, you know, like I said, we're looking for the hair bulbs and if we don't see them, you know, we lose a lot of infl uh, information. Are there any other questions about biopsies? Because that's a good, really important for us. Yeah, that's a, a great question, Scott. I had a biopsy of a potential DLE um, patient yesterday on the scalp, and I was also wondering like what the best area would be. We ended up doing the hyperpigmented border um, of the lesion. So, But then we also ended up um, transecting it into two for DIF, and I did a four millimeter punch. So in the future, I guess I would do two separate biopsies for that. I mean, in general, I would say that's preferable, but not, you know, I, I might have done a slightly larger biopsy if I was going to split it like a five millimeter punch or six millimeter punch and send half for DIF or two four millimeter punches. For the DIF, you could get away with a smaller and more superficial uh, punch biopsy uh, because we're really just looking for in discoid lupus, we're really looking for the dermal epidermal junction. Uh, actually, frankly, I, I don't really think that the DIF is absolutely necessary in, in DLE. Uh, it usually looks pretty characteristic under the microscope. Uh, so 
but I, it, I'm sure it will be fine. Thank you. All right, well, if that's it, I'm glad it was clear. And uh, next year, maybe I'll have some slightly better pictures for you. Uh, but this, so what? Go ahead. I was just saying thanks so much, Dr. Neat. This was great. You're welcome. All right. We will see you guys later. I guess you guys can start lunch early or go to the next lecture. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.